So what exactly is the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15? What does it have to do with the end of the age? We'll talk about that. And then an interview from a key actor in the unplanned movie. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Well, that's the number to call if you don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. If you do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, if you have another view of the end times, that's the number to call, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. Michael Brown, delighted to be with you. Yes, our new book, Not Afraid of the Antichrist, Why We Don't Believe in a Pre-Tribulation Rapture, Craig Keener and yours truly, now out today. Just got a report from one reader, said got the book, started reading it, didn't want to put it down, got it last night and started reading. So I think you'll find it to be an interesting read, an edifying read, a fascinating read, an eye-opening read, and a gracious read. Our goal is not to attack, to demean, to belittle, to mock. Our goal is to say, hey, we once held to a pre-trib rapture. Based on our study of Scripture, we don't hold to it. We haven't held to it for decades. Here's why. Here's what the Word says, and here's hope and encouragement in the midst of persecution, in the midst of opposition. So we weren't able to get to all of your calls yesterday. Those of you who believe in a pre-trib rapture and wanted to raise arguments and raise points, if you have another end-time point of view and wanted to weigh in or challenge me on anything I've said, 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call. Now, at the bottom of the hour, we're changing subjects, and... I got to see an advanced release of the unplanned movie. I shared that with you a couple of weeks ago, how intensely impacted I was watching it. And there is, there is a character that when you see the movie, you will not like. She is a Planned Parenthood leader, and she is Planned Parenthood to the core. And she does a great job of playing this role. I mean, I did not like her whatsoever in the movie. She did a great job. She's going to be joining us. We'll introduce that actress to you a little bit later in the broadcast. Okay, let's revisit an argument that came up a couple of times yesterday. One caller was upset with me for not recognizing this argument or just ignoring this argument. It has to do with the last trumpet. All right, so we know that Jesus teaches elsewhere John's gospel, for example, that he will raise us up at the last day. So that's another reason that we believe that we are raised up when he returns at the end of this age, not seven years earlier, but rather at the end of this age, the last day, that's when he raises us up. But Paul writes this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. So when I held to a pre-trib rapture, I taught that the last trumpet here was different than the seventh of seventh trumpet in Revelation 11 and was different from the trumpet blast of Matthew 24. After the tribulation of those days, the Lord comes with a trumpet blast but it was the same as the trumpet in 1 Thessalonians 4, because that I interpret it with regard to the rapture. Now, how could I say that the last trumpet actually wasn't the last? Well, I, because it didn't fit my theology to work that way, and I found a way to explain it and teach it, but upon further study of Scripture, I realized I can't do that. It's not right. So I was challenged yesterday, but what about this interpretation of the last trumpet? What about it has nothing to do with last in terms of the last of this age or the seventh of seven trumpets in Revelation? Rather, it was the last trumpet sounded on the day of trumpets, the feast of trumpets, Yom Truah in the Bible mentioned, for example, Leviticus 23 and Numbers 29, the first day of the seventh month of the year, which in Jewish tradition becomes the new year, Rosh Hashanah, the, the new year but in the Bible, it's the sounding of the trumpets, that that's all Paul was saying. And he was saying that Jesus is coming back 
with a trumpet blast. Okay, so I, I want to go to a website that quotes Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. He is one of the best known Hebrew Christian Messianic Jewish teachers, a man who really loves the Word of God. And we've here and there been in conferences together or, or done presentations side by side. But uh, he's headed up a, a teaching ministry for many, many years, like one will teach on Isaiah or one of the prophets. I mean, there'll be dozens and dozens and dozens of messages. His, his dissertation on Israelology was a very important work at his PhD from New York University, as I did. So he's a serious student of the Word, a serious teacher of the Word. So if, if I'm going to beg to differ with someone, it would be someone like Dr. Fruchtenbaum, whose work I really respect. And he is a a historic strong teacher of the pre-tribulation rapture. So uh, here's here's the argument, all right? There's a website asked the question, does the last trump relate to the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation? And there's, there's a reply that post-tribbers do try to link the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15 with the seventh trumpet of Revelation, but that's more to try to prop up their beliefs concerning the timing of the rapture than anything. No, actually, it's not to try to prop up our beliefs. It's because we found this consistently taught throughout the New Testament. So this writer continues, the fact is that Paul was writing to the Corinthians and he was talking to them about something they were familiar with, not something that wasn't even revealed yet. All right. So obviously, he's not talking about the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation, seventh of seven trumpets. They have no idea there is such a sequence of trumpets that haven't been taught that. Yeah, I agree. But last trumpet just means the last trumpet that sounded, the trumpet that sounded on the last day, on the final day. All they have to know is that his coming is going to be with a trumpet blast. So here's what the post says. So what was the reference to the last trump about then? You'll notice that in Corinthians, Paul has been showing the connection between New Testament truths and the feasts of Israel. For example, in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, he talks about the feast of Passover and unleavened bread and shows how this is fulfilled in Jesus' death. Yes, sir, I agree with that. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 24, he speaks about the feast of first fruits and how this was fulfilled with Jesus' resurrection. I agree with that. Then, now in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he talks about the last trump and connects that with the resurrection and rapture of the church. This is simply a fulfillment of another Jewish feast, the Feast of Trumpets. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, a Jewish believer in Jesus writes in the footsteps of the Messiah, quote, it is evident from the fact that Paul used the article, the last trump, that he expected the Corinthians to know what he was talking about. The only knowledge they would have of trumpets are those spoken of in the Old Testament, especially those of the Feast of Trumpets. The last trump refers to the Feast of Trumpets and the Jewish practice of blowing trumpets at this feast each year. During the ceremony, there were a series of short trumpet sounds, concluding with one long trumpet blast, which is called Tekiah Gedola, the great trumpet blast. This is what Paul means by the last trump. As such, it never, it says nothing concerning the timing of the rapture, only that the rapture, whenever it occurs, will fulfill the Feast of Trumpets. Another article by Fruchtenbaum says this, the seven holy seasons of Leviticus 23 are fulfilled in the order in which they fall. What follows the Feast of Trumpets is the Day of Atonement, which was the day of Israel's national atonement, coupled with the affliction of the soul. The day of atonement is to be fulfilled by the seven years of tribulation during which Israel will suffer afflictions leading up to her national repentance and restoration. And just as the feast of trumpets precedes the day of atonement, so will the rapture precede the seven years of tribulation. Hey, I, I, I appreciate those arguments and I agree for sure. I agree for sure that Messiah's death corresponds with Passover, his resurrection with first fruits, the outpouring of the spirit with Pentecost, feast of weeks, I agree that his return corresponds with the Feast of Trumpets, National Atonement for Israel with the Day of Atonement, and in gathering of the nations to Jerusalem with Feast of Tabernacles. I agree with all that. However, I don't agree with the sequence where there's a seven-year tribulation in between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Now, let me explain this. Everybody stay with me. I do not know if the exact sequence of trumpet blasts, shofar blasts that we are familiar with in synagogues today and have been for some centuries, if that can clearly be dated back to the time of Jesus. In other words, I don't know in the temple in that day that they had that exact right with those exact blasts. Now, maybe someone can convince me that that was the case, but I'm not aware of that being the case, which would mean that the Corinthians, even if 
they started in the synagogue. They were God-fearing Gentiles in the synagogue, and then they came to, to learn more a, about the true gospel and the true Messiah through Paul and other, uh, other emissaries, that it's unlikely that they would have known about that exact sequence of trumpet blasts. But even if they did, Tikiyagu Dola, so the great blast, is not the last trump. In other words, I have scoured the relevant literature looking for a clear teaching within Jewish literature that on the, the, the day of the sounding of the trumpet, Yom Truah, which again becomes the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah in Jewish tradition, I've looked for clear statements that there was this, the last trump, and everyone knew what the last trump was. I have not found that. I've looked at commentary after commentary in 1 Corinthians, and they either agree that it is the, the last trumpet that sounds, the final one, all right? Hence, if you have a trumpet sounding in Matthew 24, when Jesus returns, he comes with the sound of the trumpet. Well, well hang on. If he comes with the sound of the trumpet seven years earlier, and then he comes with the sound of the trumpet seven years later, and the coming with the sound of the trumpet for the rapture is the last trump, then what's the one after the last one? And if the coming with the sound of the trumpet fulfills the Feast of Trumpets, the rapture, seven years earlier, then what is his second coming with the sound of a trumpet fulfill if not the Feast of Trumpets all over again? <clears throat> That's why when I see 1 Corinthians 15 saying that we'll be caught up to meet him at the last trump, 1 Thessalonians 4 telling us the same thing, the dead and Messiah will rise and we'll be caught up together, those who are alive and remain, to meet him in the air, with a trumpet blast, and I see that, and I see Matthew 24, after the tribulation of those days, he will come with the sound of the trumpet. It's obviously the same trumpet, especially if one is called the last. Then other New Testament scholars agree, yes, it's the last meaning, it's the final one, it's the one on the last day. And some say, yes, it would mean the last in terms of sequence. So hence, the seven trumpets in Revelation, the seven trumpets in Revelation, 1 Corinthians 15 would then correspond to Revelation 11, when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. So with all respect to those who hold that argument, I, I frankly do not find it supportable by the ancient literature, nor do I find it supportable logically, nor do I see how after a last trumpet that fulfills the Feast of Trumpets, there is another coming with a trumpet after the last one. We'll be right back. You know, we talk about scriptures being the word of God. It's also clear they were written by human beings, that, that Paul tells Timothy, hey, please bring my cloak, and it's going to be cold here in the winter when I'm in prison. And it's interesting that when Ezekiel says, thus saith the Lord, that his words come out different than when Isaiah says, thus saith the Lord, or Jeremiah says, thus saith the Lord. So how do we explain that? Is the Bible written by God or men? 2 Timothy 3.16 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All Scripture is breathed out by God. How can it be breathed out by God and yet come in so many different human forms? Someone used this analogy once. When the light shines through a window, that the, the light on one side of the window is slightly different than on the other side. What if the light shined through colored glass? Now it's gonna come out very different on the other side. But what if God who made the light also made the glass so that through the multicolored panels on that glass window, that stained glass window, the light came out on the other side just the way he intended. So yes, of course, the Bible is full of humanity. It's full of human emotion. The Bible is full of human expression and human vocabulary and human distinctives from one culture to another. And yet it is breathed out by God so that we get the very word of God, just what God wanted to communicate to us, we get in an absolutely inspired, infallible form. So yes, it is the word of God through men, 
but inspired by God, breathed out by God, so we can say the scriptures are the word. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the Line of Fire. 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call. By the way, have you seen my latest article, Google versus God's Word? Google versus God's Word. We now have this specific information. Daily Call, Caller reported it exclusively last night. I've written on it as well. That our video, Can You Be Gay and Christian, got some employees at Google upset. They then complained about it. It went up to a vice president at Google, Vishal Sharma, who looked at it specifically and said, yes, this is inappropriate. This is against our values. To paraphrase, we will not allow it to be advertised on YouTube. So here you have employees getting offended by gospel truth, a VP at Google saying, nope, we will not allow it to be advertised on YouTube. And basically it's Google setting itself against God's word. I mean, it's really simple. There's no gay bashing on the video. There's no homophobia. There's no hatred. They're simply speaking the truth in love. That's why I asked a while ago, will, will YouTube ban the Bible? Now, this doesn't discourage me. I, I feel bad for Google. They have massive power on the internet and can be tremendously influential. Look, this, it, it's company. It's here today, going to be gone tomorrow. That's, that's the reality. God's word is going to stand. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, but, but my words will never pass away. So read the article, share it with others. And if you've never watched Can You Be Gay and Christian, by all means, watch it and share it widely. The more people try to keep us down, the more we speak up and speak out. But we could use your help in doing so, friends. Uh, it costs money to be on the air. It costs money to produce these videos. It costs money to take the gospel to nations around the earth. It takes money to be on the front lines of reaching the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It takes money to produce these resources, even with a whole team working sacrificially. So thank you in advance for standing with us together, we are making a difference. Now, you might say to me, you might say, I I've got a problem with what you just presented. 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-784. I got a problem with what you just presented about the end times based on the feast, the, the holy days of the seventh month of the calendar. Because look, it says... And the first day of the seventh month, that's trumpets. Then there's a 10-day period, and then Day of Atonement. And then five days after that, so the first day is trumpets, the 10th day is Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. The 15th day is Sukkot, Tabernacle. So you could say to me, how can you say that trumpets is, is followed by Day of Atonement when there's 10 days in between? Uh, that that's obviously the tribulation time, the time of testing. The number 10 speaks of the time of testing. Well, here's the problem. Here's the problem. If, if, you, if you believe in a post-trib, a pre-trib rapture, so you say that those 10 days, that represents the seven-year period. Well, hang on. What you have then is, is after the Lord returns, immediately after that, the, the survivors of the nations that tried to attack Jerusalem will, will come to Jerusalem to worship at the Feast of Tabernacles, but that's, that's five days later. So based on this chronology, it would be like several years before that even happens, whereas from what we can tell it happens within that first year. I don't, I don't look at those days, 10 days there and five days as actually speaking of a definite time period, but rather the 10 is symbolic of testing and purging. And what we see in Zechariah 12 is that when Jesus returns, when he visibly appears, those glorious verses in, in Hebrew, he beat to a light to share Dakar, they'll look to, to me whom they've pierced and they'll mourn over him. There'll they'll be, they'll be deep mourning and repentance. That's the day, that's that, that 10 day symbolism. That's the, the repentance that leads up to the day of atonement. So we welcome him back, the Jewish people. We acknowledge who he is. We're broken in repentance. We're grieving. We, we can't believe that, that we've rejected him. We can't believe that 
that the one we thought was responsible for our sufferings is actually our, our Savior and our Deliverer. And we weep and mourn. That's the end of Zechariah 12. Each, each group, each tribe apart, the, the, the mourning and repentance is that deep. And what does that lead to? 13.1 in Zechariah, that a fountain is then opened for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for the people of Israel. A fountain is then open of cleansing. Why? Because we're, we're being washed and cleansed of our sins. And then what does that lead to? Zechariah 14, tabernacles, the survivors of the nations that attacked Jerusalem now come up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So it does flow beautifully and clearly. 866-34-TRUTH. Let us... Go to the phones. Matthew in Illinois, you're the first one up today. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Um, hello, can you hear me? I, uh, I think I can hear you if you keep talking. Let's see. All right. Well, my question is, uh, the last Trump, it's, I think you're kind of like, um, you, you're kind of like contradicting yourself because Jesus says no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Yeah. Or this is the will of my Father. There's nothing that has given me, but raised up on the last day. For this is what my father, everyone who looks on the son and believes in him, should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Yeah. But that's not the last day in human history. Uh, that's a uh, thousand years or one thousand and seven years before the final, final last day, because you know the resurrection's before the millennium. So I just like to say, um, it seems like when it's talking about the last Trump, it's pro- the Book of Revelations wasn't written yet. And uh, it seems to me like this catching away talked about in John uh, 14, verses 1 through 3, First Thessalonians chapter 4, and First um, Corinthians, they're like a catching away where we go to heaven, and it has to happen sometime. And it doesn't make sense to go right back up and right back down. Uh, but right G- but Jesus, also- yeah, well, well, yeah so, so hang on. Let, let, let me respond to a bunch of things. First, there's zero contradiction. Because the last trumpet is the last, and you're telling me it's not the last. That's seven years after that. There's no Matthew. Matthew, Matthew let me talk. Let me talk. You're never going to learn if you don't listen. Okay, fair enough. I let you. I let you yeah. state your point. So first thing is, if the last trumpet is not the last trumpet, even in this age, okay, then it has no meaning whatsoever. It is the last day of this age. We will be resurrected. That is the end of this age. Then we have the millennial kingdom. It's something now totally new, Jesus reigning on the earth. So it is the last day of this age. It is the last trump of this age. That's the first thing. Second thing, the teaching, the teaching, Matthew, tell you what, last chance to just stay back. Otherwise, I'll put you on hold. You'll just be able to listen, but not weigh in. All right. I let you, I let you present your point. I'm responding to each one. But here, here's my problem. Let me be totally candid with you, bud. You'll never learn anything without listening. You'll never learn. If, if immediately you're responding without digesting what I'm saying, I don't say this to belittle. It's, it's my habit, too, to immediately speak. That's to listen and digest first, all right? So first thing is the, the, the last trumpet is not going to be followed by another trumpet in the same age. It's not the last. That's number one. And the last day that we're going to be raised is not seven years be- before the end of this age. It's the last day of this age. Number three, the teachings of Jesus were certainly circulating, and he said he was coming back with the sound of the trumpet after the tribulation of those days in Matthew 24. All right, so he tells us exactly when it's going to happen after the tribulation of those days, and his coming is with the sound of a trumpet. You have a scenario in which Jesus, the Son of God, comes within inches of the earth, but actually doesn't arrive, even though we're waiting for his uh, arrival, where he comes secretly and invisibly, even though we're waiting for his visible appearing, then he comes right to here, gets us, and turns all the way around and goes back, as opposed to he appears in glory, catches us up to meet him, and we descend with him. John 14 does not mention a catching away. John 14 is not a rapture verse. John 14 is a promise to believers through the ages that he has a place prepared for us, and that he's going to bring us there to be, be, what, what, for seven years? No, that's his our eternal home. So there's, there's not a syllable that you said that, contradicts anything, nor have I been self-contradictory in anything that I've said. Um, but Jesus also says the resurrection on uh, the last day. He says, my words will judge him on the resurrection on the last day. Are you saying that's a different last day? No. But you said the resurrection is the last day of this age, but the judgment's not until the last day of the millennium. 
Yeah, well, the, the, first thing, the first thing is there is in 2 Peter 3 that from his coming, his physical coming until the end of the millennium, that is referred to as the last day. But, but just interestingly, that, that that whole period, the day of the Lord, is from his visible appearing in the clouds at the end of the tribulation until the end of the millennial kingdom. The, the problem is, though, yep. so, so I, I, I have no problem if God wants to extend that, that last day, but you are saying that the last trumpet is not the trumpet of the second coming, that that's the previous trumpet. That's, that's the, the fundamental problem, that you're saying that there is a trumpet in this age after the last trumpet, and it's the trumpet that Jesus spoke about with his return. Wouldn't the Corinthians know about that, Matthew? Wouldn't the Corinthians know that Jesus taught about the, the there's no other reference to a, to a trumpet anywhere that's relevant. And, and, and there's like a reason no, no one ever heard of, is, are, are you waiting for the a secret almost arrival or for the visible appearing of Jesus? What are you waiting for? What are you looking for? Well, I think, um, are you, are you longing for his appearing or for an invisible almost arrival? I don't think it's going to be invisible when he comes for his things. I think he's going to descend from heaven with the voice of an archangel. People are going to be able to see him, but he's not going to come down to earth. He's coming. But it's his, his coming. Bride. It's his coming. It's his parousia. It's his arrival. Well, see, just rethink it. He's not going to turn around and bring us to feast in heaven while the Jews get slaughtered on the earth. No, he's going to preserve us, keep us in the midst of tribulation. As always, we may die for the faith, but that's fine. When he appears, we're waiting for his appearing, his visit, and his arrival, his coming. Not for an almost arrival. We're waiting for his coming. So did God create sin? Does the Bible say that God created evil? If that's the case, wouldn't he then be the author of sin? the author of evil? Wouldn't that be contrary to verses that say that God is light and in him is no darkness at all? Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. And I want to explain how this verse has sometimes been understood to say that God created evil. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7 says this. So King James, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You say, well, there it says create evil. Well, the New King James correctly changes it to create calamity. Other translations say create disaster. So what, in fact, is this verse saying? The Hebrew word translated evil in the King James or calamity in the New King James is the Hebrew word ra or ra. That word means fundamentally something bad. When human beings do something bad, they commit evil. When God brings something bad on someone, say in judgment, then he is creating calamity. He's not creating evil. The idea that God could do evil or create evil is totally contrary to his nature. Everything he does is good and right. That's why the Bible says that God kills and gives life. He puts to death and gives life, but it doesn't say he murders because murder is the unjust taking of a human life. So, no, God does not create evil. That's a mistranslation in the King James. The Hebrew ra, 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 always in this context would mean calamity, disaster. When God will say, you've done ra, 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 you've done evil, so I'm going to bring ra, 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 I'm going to bring calamity, disaster. That's the constant context in which these things are found. And even in the verse itself, it's not opposite, it's not good or bad, but it's shalom, peace, or calamity. God's saying, I'm bring them both. You say, where does evil come from then? That is part of the mystery of free will, be it the free will of the angels in heaven or the free will of, of Adam and Eve on earth, that freedom is given to say yes or no. And if we choose freely to say no, then that actuates evil. Then evil is actuated through the action of, of our will. And now born in a fallen world, evil is just part of our world, part of our society, part of our human nature from which we need deliverance and forgiveness through the cross. But does God create sin? Is God the author of evil? Does the Bible teach that? 
Absolutely not. He will work through Satan. He will work through demons. He will work through evil in this world to accomplish his purpose. But his purpose is good. He doesn't do evil. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. So I have shared with you what happened a few weeks ago when I sat down to watch an advanced release of the unplanned movie and did not quite know what was coming, when it was going to come, and got completely overwhelmed by it sobbing uncontrollably, just devastated by what I saw and tremendously moved by the movie as a whole, the story of Abby Johnson, former Planned Parenthood director, youngest one in the country, who then really surrenders her heart to the Lord and recognizes the evil of abortion. And there's one, one character in the movie, comes out March 29th, you want to see it, and don't worry about the fact it's rated R, it's rated R because Hollywood has a problem with truth about abortion. There's one character I really did not like at all. She did a great job of, <laughs> of being who she was. And it's my delight to have her on the air with me, Robbia Scott. Uh, welcome to The Line of Fire. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Is it your delight? Do you love to hate me or do you just love me? Let's talk about it. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I, I did not like you in the movie. I, I don't want folks to know everything that, that comes, but the court case at the end, I was very glad with the way that thing came down. Um, but but let's, let's yes, first talk. I don't understand why that always gets such a big cheer in the private screenings I've attended. Everyone seems so happy when my demise is at hand. Yeah, well, I, I want to talk to you about private screenings in, in a moment. But first, uh, you were not always a follower of Jesus. You were not always doing ministry work. So tell our listeners and viewers about yourself be before you knew the Lord. That is correct. I uh, was a young girl, and I saw the movie Flashdance, and I decided at that point that I needed to become a professional dancer. Uh, I got a big perm. Yes, it was the 80s, and I did perm my hair and uh, bought a bunch of leg warmers and started training very seriously as a dancer. Well, uh, a few years after that, I wound up being hired by Prince, I toured the world with him as the pearl half of Diamonds and Pearls from his hit album in the early 90s. Uh, danced in front of 60,000 people at a time, did all his music videos, transitioned after my two years with Prince into acting, and was on shows such as Beverly Hills 90210 and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And it was during the time I was on Buffy the Vampire Slayer that I became a Christian. And uh, very shortly thereafter that, uh, after that, I just felt conflicted with what was available in Hollywood, and I also felt just an affinity for the things of God, the power of God, the Spirit, and I knew that God was transitioning me out of a 20-year career in Hollywood into full-time ministry. So I've been doing that for the last 15 years. I'm a Christian speaker, teacher, author, my book, Counterfeit Comfort, and I honestly had no intention of ever going back to Hollywood, but God had a different plan. Mm. So, so you lived what many people would have thought was the dream dancing with and for Prince and great crowds and all that. When you were in the midst of it, did you find it satisfying and fulfilling? Even before you knew the Lord, did you think this is it, this is wonderful, or, or did something strike you then, uh, something's hollow, something's missing? Well, everyone thinks that the success and the money and the fame is the answer until you have the success and the money and the fame. And, yeah. and then you realize that it just really isn't. And although I was doing quite well in many areas, you know, I was in my early 20s traveling the world on television. Uh, I appeared to have it all together, but I was struggling. I was a chain smoker. I was dealing with my uh, with food and body image issues that I think most women deal with, but especially being a dancer and an actress, it just exacerbates the issue. So, you know, I was just struggling. I felt uncomfortable. I felt a bit fearful, anxious. Uh, I could not get free with this constant format about food. And that's what drove me to really start seeking and searching for God. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that's so interesting about it is the Scripture says, whoever loves silver is not satisfied with silver. Whoever loves gold is not satisfied with gold says that the lustful eyes of a man are never satisfied. So the thing is always there telling you, if I just have this, if I could just do this, yeah. if I could just be this, exactly. but it's never, it never, it never gets there. So, so what a lesson. Uh, one other question before we talked about your role in Unplanned, 
there are a lot of professing Christians in Hollywood. There are Christians in the professing Christians in all aspects of the music industry. And many times I'm, I, I may have seen a headline about a particular person or maybe some raunchy picture, you know, featuring them. I think oh, it doesn't interest me. And then later you find out, oh, they're Christian. They love the Lord. And I think some, something doesn't quite line up between loving the Lord and being used as some kind of sex symbol or in these, you know, raunchy, gratuitous, violence, profane films. You felt a contradiction when, when you were in the midst of the, the Hollywood industry following Jesus. There was a conflict there. Do you think that perhaps if we knew the Lord more deeply, there'd be, there'd be more conflicted people about living in compromise? That's a great question, and I would have to agree with you. I think that as you really go into the depths of God, uh, you, do, you would get that, that uh, conflict, and you would also see, you know, if you really, if God is really first and foremost in your life, or if that desire for success is first. And if you do trust God, he'll, you know, he's not going to give you, uh, put a gift in you and not use it. And I'm sort of an example of that. You know, here we are all these years later, and, you know, now God has brought me back around to, to use the gift of acting, but for something that is for the kingdom. All right. So the, the unplanned movie, and again, friends, it opens on March 29th. I, I knew that it got an, an R rating because of some disturbing images, but nothing, nothing that would compare to a normal R-rated movie these days. Obviously, the issue was abortion. And I, I don't want to say exactly when this happens in the movie, but Abby Johnson's moment when she sees the reality of abortion, I knew the effect. I know the effect that that had on me watching it in the privacy of my home. I'm wondering what effect it's going to have when people are seeing this in movie theaters across America. So at private screenings, when, when she watches the ultrasound, what happens in the audience? It is a myriad of, of reactions. We have people emotional, uh, where you can literally hear them uh, reacting. We've had some people just uh, it'd be overwhelming for them. They couldn't view it. We've actually had a few times where um, people have fainted <laughs> and actually uh, passed out. And we've had to deal with that. And I, I don't want to say this to scare people because uh, really overall the movie is, is quite impactful. It's, yeah. it's a beautiful story. It's a story of hope. It's a story of redemption. But I, I, I do find it interesting that I believe as a culture we've become so desensitized to violence because we see it every minute on television yep. and in movies. So we can see people brutally murdering one another. We can see these graphic sexual scenes and it not affects us in any way. Yet compared to that kind of imagery, what we show on the movie is, you know, it's not gratuitous. Right. And it's, and it's not, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't even compare to that. Nope. But because it's so foreign, because we've never seen this, actually seen it with our eyes on camera, it is so shocking to our soul and to our spirit. So people have a very strong reaction. But like you stated, you know, in a rated R movie, <coughs> excuse me, you know, as parents, as, as churchgoers, as church leaders, you know, we want to protect ourselves from that graphic violence, from that extreme sexuality. We don't want our young children to see that. But the imagery in this film, we do not want to protect ourselves from seeing. Yeah. We do not want to protect our teenagers from seeing. This is the truth on the screen that needs to be seen. Because when you see it with your own eyes, you cannot be the same. If you're pro-life, if you're pro-choice, regardless of your stance, after you see this movie, you do not come out of the theater the same way. No, no, you don't. And, and Robia, when, when I watched it at home, I had mentioned to my wife, Nancy, that I was going to be watching it. She didn't really hear me say that, and it didn't register. So when I, I tried to compose myself, and I was about to go teach a night class uh, at our ministry school, I came walking out to talk to her, but I couldn't talk. And, and I broke down sobbing. She actually got scared because she thought somebody just died or, you know, what, what happened when I got to class mm -hmm. and just began to share with the students at our ministry school about what's happening, updating them on laws in New York and comments from the governor of Virginia and the infanticide mm -hmm. debate now and all that. Students began weeping. This is without seeing it. And, and we spent the next two and a half hours praying and crying. And, and I'm thinking, you know, and again, there's nothing gratuitous. There's nothing there. It's not like some terrible... You, you see much more graphic pictures about abortion just by uh, looking for it online. 
but just the, simpl- the simple reality of what happens in an abortion, even fairly early in the pregnancy, is, is something that the world definitely does not want people to see. So you, as a Planned Parenthood director, how did you, as a, as a major leader in Planned Parenthood, I mean, you, a, a, as a real <laughs> feminist, I mean, you, you, were, you, you carried it. Well, I was wondering, who is this gal before, before I found you. out more? Okay, how do you then get, obviously, you know you're doing this for the gospel, right? But you know you're going to be hated. How do you get yourself into preparing to do something like this? Oh, you know, I, I was wary at first when I read a little portion of the script. I thought, oh, my goodness, now I'm a Christian. I'm so interested in going back into entertainment. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get to play this beautiful, anointed, uh, ministry-type <laughs> character. And no, God brings me back for this character. Uh, so, and I was wary because the subject matter is so intense and the character is so intense. But I knew quickly, I knew quickly in prayer that God had called me back for such a time as this, that this movie is for such a time as this. And I just, I, I just felt like I understood how to play the character. I understood that uh, I really wanted to dial her up in terms of her drive, ambition, uh, just that need to be successful, that need to win at all costs. Uh, and just turn down the compassion and turn down, uh, you know, really any kind of concern for uh, anyone else. <laughs> and, and that's how I played it. I, I just played her uh, very focused and a, a strong need to win. And and there's a key point in the movie after Abby Johnson, played by Ashley Bratcher, who'll, who'll be on with us uh, right around when the movie comes out, uh, when when you give her the reward for Employee of the Year, I mean, all all real, and now you talk about how you, they've got to produce more abortions, they've got to meet quota and things like that. Uh, obviously, the movie is factual. So you know this to be true. In other words, you know that as you played the role, that Planned Parenthood is, is actually trying to get more abortions to make more money, and that's, that's a big part of who they are. This is why this film is so important. Uh, so much of our culture does not understand who Planned Parenthood is, because of the propaganda that Planned Parenthood has fed us. You know, television programming does just that. It programs us as to what to believe. And because so much of the media has been from the left side, Planned Parenthood has convinced many, even of the Christians, of the body of Christ, that, you know, they're a health clinic, they're about women's rights, they're about benefiting women, you know, very small percentage is abortion, only if it's desperate and we want to make sure it's safe. But that is not the truth. And that's why I'm so passionate about doing this film. All right, hey, stay right there. Just got a few more minutes with Robia Scott. Her book, Counterfeit Comfort. And she plays a key role in Unplanned. We'll play a clip from the movie when we come back. Is Satan everywhere at the same time? It is the devil omnipresent. I see no scriptural emphasis on that or no scriptural backing for that whatsoever. God alone is omnipresent. Angels are not omnipresent. Created beings are not omnipresent. And Satan is both a created being and an angel, a fallen created being, a fallen angel. You know, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, Matthew chapter four, verse 11, after Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, it says this, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So Satan left, angels came. Neither of them are omnipresent. Just because Satan is a spirit being and we can't see him, you can have the feeling, well, he's omnipresent. No, only God fills the universe. Uh, Only as it said of God in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Only of God, as it says in Jeremiah 23, that he fills heaven and earth. It's not said of Satan. Satan is not omnipresent. Satan is a powerful, dark, spiritual being, very powerful, very deceptive, and he has a well-organized army of demon powers under him, whether those are fallen angels or wherever we get the class of demons from, and, and they are sent out. And when we resist demons, we are resisting Satan. When it tells us in 1 Peter 5 to resist Satan, it doesn't mean that each of us is personally resisting him because he's everywhere at the same time. No, he comes and he goes. Just like in Matthew, the fourth chapter, he leaves and looks for more opportune time. Satan is not omnipresent, 
Let's not give him credit he doesn't deserve. Only God is almighty. Only God is omniscient. Only God is omnipresent. Absolutely not Satan. Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Pat Johnson is in the other room. Here. Here. Our first order of business is to present Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award. Abby Johnson. This is Abby Johnson. This is Abby. Abby. She's our newest volunteer escort. Abby, 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 this is Cheryl Alessandro. I'd be the, I'd be youngest, the youngest director in Planned Parenthood history. history. You'll, You'll actually, actually be in charge of the abortion at your clinic. clinic. I have a chance, have a chance to, make to make a real difference. difference. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, you're still going to be a baby killer. The only thing that's changed is you, Abby. You even hear yourself talk right now about these procedures that are little babies. I'm not going to apologize for doing a job that helps women in crisis. They're so, They're so sorry for me that he's in church. church. Okay, fine. But the, but one, the thing one thing that all experts, experts agree on, on is that at this stage, stage the fetus can't, can't kill anything. anything. All right. The woman playing Cheryl there, the one giving out the award for Planned Parenthood Employee of the Year, is with us now, Robia Scott. And uh, again, as as you play that role, I'm, I'm looking now at just your, your picture that came with background here, smiling, looks like someone that loves the <laughs> Lord, gentle heart, you know, that's, <laughs> that's and, and, I mean, you weren't a monster in the movie. You, you were what I would think was this, a strong female pro abortion leader committed to the cause and believing in it. You know, you can't, you can't overly demonize. There's the human side to it, but it is, it is someone that I was actively rooting against through the movie. Uh, did you have family interacting with you about this? Uh, you know, how they felt about you playing this role? Uh, just my husband, really, and he was completely supportive. He knew I was uh, I was supposed to do it. But yes, I am the I am the love to hate, and people do find it quite surprising when they find out that I am actually a full time minister after they see the role. Quite a dichotomy. Yeah, friends, unplannedfilm.com unplannedfilm.com coming out March 29th. How is it that the, the directors came to you? You'd, you'd been out of the business for some years. You were just engaged in ministry. It's not like you had a resume out looking for acting jobs. If it happens to be the right pro-life Christian movie or something, exactly. uh, obviously. Yeah. So how did, how did they come to you? It was really an only God uh, set up of circumstances. It just does not make any sense how I'm in this movie. I was on a Christian talk show talking about my book, Counterfeit Comforts. I randomly met a woman there who happened to know the writers and directors of this movie. She just felt by the Lord that she was supposed to introduce me. They wanted to meet me. We went and had a coffee. And a couple of weeks later, I was reading for the movie. And a couple of weeks after that, I was hired. Mm. And was, was there a sense of, of God's presence God's direction, God's anointing on certain key parts of the movie. Again, things are broken up so much. You know, it's not like you just do a 10 minute section or something. It's, you know, in, in professional filming. But was there a sense of, of God's grace in the midst of what you're doing? Could you sense it? Yes. We definitely felt the resistance and the warfare on set because we all knew really early on that what we were doing was bigger than all of us. Uh, and we knew that. You know, the enemy ne definitely did not want this movie to come to pass. But the writer directors also understood just how important prayer was. And we literally had a prayed a prayer department on this film. So, just like you have a wardrobe department, a hair and makeup department, we had a prayer, intercessory prayer department of five men and women that were continually praying over the, the directors, over the crew, over the, over the set. And it was crucial, it made all the difference. And and Pure Flix is now helping get the movie Abby out. Johnson and is in the other room. All right, hang hang on. Uh, started playing a clip there. All right, so um, we're uh, uh, Pure Flix is helping with the distribution, and I think it's eight nine hundred theaters. It's it's opening up. And do you expect there to be an immediate pushback? 
people trying to protest, trying to get it out of these theaters. What do you anticipate coming? Because nothing, nothing like this has ever been done in the history of Hollywood. Oh, goodness. I don't know what to expect. I do know that originally we were going to be in 800 theaters. Now we're going to be in 1,100 theaters wow. because the demand is just growing. And I encourage all the listeners, go to unplanned.com and you can plug your zip code in and find out what theater is playing by you. I also encourage that everyone who's listening, if this is an important subject for you and you do not want to see you know, your state become New York and you want to really vote on this, that we can vote with our movie ticket. Because the way the entertainment industry works is when a movie has a big, huge opening box office, it gets the media's attention, even if they don't want to talk about it. Even the left side will talk about it if it's making a lot of money. It gets Hollywood's attention. The movie can go to more theaters and last longer and impact more people. So it's crucial that all of us get out on opening weekend. Uh, in terms of what kind of pushback we get, I have no idea what to expect. I really don't. But I do feel that God is on this. And regardless of what obstacles try to come, you know, persecution, the R rating, I, I just think it's going to plow past all of that because I do believe this is a, for such a time as this movie. Um, God could not have orchestrated the timing any better. You know that uh, they, Chuck and Carrie, who directed the film, had the rights to Abby Johnson's story unplanned for six years. And every mm. time they went to make the movie, God said, not yet. Wow. The next year they went to make it, God said, not yet. The next year they went to make it, God said, not yet. And they're men who follow the voice of the Lord. And finally, God released them to make this movie. So had this come out three years ago, it would have been good. Four years ago, it would have been good. But for God to ordain this movie to come out now, on March 29th, with what's just happened, you know, with what's going on in these last couple months, like you said, New York and the Senate and these things that are unfathomable, who would have thought we would see this in our lifetime, that we'd be celebrating having an abortion at nine months, that we'd be uh, allowing, uh, uh, killing babies after birth? Who, who would have thought that we would ever see this? <laughs> yeah. But for this movie to come out right now to impact culture, it is just only God. Yeah, I was talking to a pro-life leader. He's been in this for 40 years, and he said, Mike, the timing of this whole thing is unbelievable. And I didn't know that detail of the story. And, of course, Ashley has her own story with her mom, which, which we'll let her tell when she's on the air. Yeah. Uh, new statement from uh, presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke, uh, where he says it's absolutely a woman's right. It's a woman's choice. My answer to you about uh, late, late trimester abortions, my answer to you is that that should be a decision that the woman makes. I trust her. So the lines are being drawn so, so clearly. And the reaction to this is going to be intense. You know, the Gosnell movie came out and it, and it played, played a role. The media tried to ignore the whole Gosnell trial. But, but this, because of the women involved, because of the side it takes, because of it showing the reality of abortion, th this is going to hit from a whole other angle. And, and I, I know that you have folks praying for you, but I really encourage you to, to keep the prayer support up because you play such a key role in this and, and you know you're, you're going to come under spiritual attack. But that means that, that you, you are one of the key players in the battle for life right now. Only, only God. So, friends, March 29th, that weekend, you've got to get out. I can't strongly enough recommend it. I'll be writing and pushing it every way. We know how as well. Unplanned.com. And, uh, folks, Pray for Robia Scott. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna be cheering her on. Now that you know who she is, you'll be cheering her on. But you can root against her during the movie. All right. And then once the movie's over, <laughs> pray for Grace. And I'm sure you're gonna be doing all kinds of interviews as well. So may the Lord be with you and use you amazingly Thank in you. the days ahead. Thanks so much. Thank you. I really appreciate you standing behind the movie and supporting us. Hundred percent. All right. So friends, I want to play one more clip from the unplanned movie. Take your family to don't worry about the R the R rating, okay? Trust me, it's 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 not there are plenty of PG movies, PG thirteen movies with all kinds of objectionable scenes that folks go to. All right. Don't let the R rate rating scare. Now, if if you can't if you can talk to your kids about abortion, then they can see this. That's as simple as it is. But you need to be out. Opening weekend, let's pack out the theaters, and I can't wait to see what the reactions are going to be. All right, let's play one more clip from Unplanned. Sorry to bother you, but they need an extra person in the back room. room. Are you free? Are you free? I saw, I saw it. it. It was like, like a twisting, twisting and fighting, fighting, fighting Prince Prince. Hey, hey. We commend the souls of these hundreds of children. children. 
And Lord, and we, Lord pray we pray to end, to end abortion. abortion. I really appreciate what you've done for us, Russ. I'll not forget, forget it. it. 22,000 abortions. Rough day at the office. You can say that. It's your dad and me. You are our baby from the moment of conception. We are we paying are you to be a perfect, perfect instrument, instrument of corporate, corporate policy. policy. We, we are an abortion, abortion provider. I can't be part of this anymore. anymore. Everything, Everything that, that they told, told us is a lie. lie. Don't, Don't underestimate, underestimate the repercussions, repercussions of this. this. You gotta be you gotta careful. Be careful. Congratulations, you've made an enemy of one of the most powerful organizations on the planet. Yeah, uh, that last voice that you just heard, that's the guest that we just had with us, Robia Scott. And uh, you want to see the movie, trust me on that. Get your friends out, get your churches out. Let's pack the theaters. Let this be part of the major turning point coming in our nation a rise of a cry for the life of the unborn, an exposing of the evil of abortion, and a cry of mercy and forgiveness and compassion for women who've had abortion that come to God and say, forgive me. Jesus died for that sin. If you're convicted now, turn to him and he'll have mercy on you. He's a God of life. He's a God of forgiveness. Jesus died to bring about change. The worst of sins he died for. Back with you tomorrow, friends.